Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm, we, we'd actually announced the time for this as being nine o'clock, but I can tell that a lot of you are alums who remember Berkeley time, so that <laughs> despite our intentions of deviating from Berkeley time, this was not possible. Um, I'm Fiona Doyle. I'm the Executive Associate Dean in the College of Engineering. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to what I know is going to be a lively conversation. And I should thank you very much for turning out um, at such an early hour on a Saturday morning. The fact that you're here, I know, demonstrates the fact that this is an issue that you do feel very strongly about. Um, I'd like to welcome alumni who are coming back as well as our current students and their families. It's wonderful when um, the families of our students actually come and visit to see kind of what we're all about. Um, and I can assure you, if I put on my hat as the um, undergraduate dean, that we do our best to take very good care of um, your sons and daughters, um, to all parents who are here. Um, on to the topic for today's conversation. Um, it's very apparent in today's economy that there's an ongoing need for um, well-educated engineers and scientists. In addition to that, um, and this actually is the focus of what I'm doing in a freshman seminar um, this semester, um, society as a whole is facing some enormous challenges for the 21st century very big challenges, and engineers are absolutely crucial for addressing these problems that are facing humanity. It sounds like hyperbole, but really the future of mankind, if not totally resting on engineers and scientists, is going to be very strongly dependent upon what today's generation of um, scientists and engineers actually contributes. Um, there's an enormously important need for well-educated people. Um, one of the things within that general broader context that we're acutely aware of is the fact that we need to have more women in engineering and in the sciences. Um, women are currently comprising 58% of the total workforce, yet they only fill 13% um, of jobs that are specific to engineering. Um, as engineers, we have a social responsibility to actually spark an interest in engineering um, among young women um, to make sure that they have what they need to succeed and that they're going to be available to address our problems. This isn't just a question of political correctness. Um, those of you who are engineers know that, in general, engineers work in teams. And there's a huge amount of research that demonstrates very forcibly that the quality of um, solutions that teams produce depends upon the diversity of the team members. And women have, in many cases, a different perspective, a different view on the world. Um, just as people who come from different backgrounds have different ways of looking at problems. And the more diverse team you can assemble to actually address significant problems, as I say, the better the solution is going to be. So we're at a point in the history of humanity where we really need to have engineers who represent the breadth of diversity in the population. So at Berkeley, um, what we're doing to increase, or, um, we're doing a lot to increase the number of women um, graduates. We're fostering a supportive um, learning and social environment, and we have um, a large number of very committed faculty and staff, resources of places like the Engineering Student Services, um, uh, Center, the Engineering Student Services, which I head. Um, we've got um, some very vibrant um, women's organizations, including Society of Women Engineers, which is um, sponsoring this event. Um, we've got um, volunteers and mentorship associations. Um, although we're very, we know that we can always do more, we are very proud of where Berkeley Engineering is at the moment. 25% um, of our undergraduate body is female, 
Um, this isn't 58%, but it's significantly better than the national average, which is just 18% of women in engineering programs. Um, some of our departments, like bioengineering, are much, much more balanced. Um, they have 37% um, women. Civil engineering is um, quite close on their tails. Today, what I want to do is give you the opportunity to hear from two of my um, female engineering faculty colleagues, as well as an unbelievable current Berkeley engineering student. Um, these young, these women, um, young women, um, they're all young relative to me. <laughs> um, they're paving the way in their fields, um, and also in important um, aspects um, such as engineering um, outreach. Um, so, with that, let me introduce our speakers. Um, our speakers are in the front row, and I'll just ask them to sort of raise their hands so that you know who's who. Um, so, first of all, we have Claire Tomlin. Um, Claire is a professor in electrical engineering and computer sciences, and she holds the Charles de Sow chair. She's recognized worldwide for her pioneering research in air traffic control and unmanned aerial vehicles. This summer, Claire spearheaded Berkeley Engineering's inaugural Girls in Engineering program, um, a week-long summer camp for middle school girls interested in engineering, science, and math. Next, we have my colleague, Lisa Pruitt who is a professor and vice chair of graduate studies in our Department of Mechanical Engineering. And Lisa holds the Lawrence Talbot chair. Lisa's research focuses on the development of materials and tools to advance technologies um, with applications in orthopedics. And finally, um, we have um, Lavanya Jawaharlal, who is a junior in mechanical engineering. Um, Lavania co-founded a startup called STEM Center USA, which is designing and making affordable robotic teaching kits for school children. To begin with, um, I've asked each of our panelists to provide you with a very brief overview of their work and how it impacts um, areas such as academics, research, and outreach. After that, um, we're going to convene as a panel and um, we'll have a Q&A session, which will give you the opportunity to ask um, questions from our very distinguished panelists. So with that, please join me in welcoming our first speaker, Professor Claire Tomlin. Thank you, Fiona, and it's a pleasure to uh, be here today to talk to you about this. Um, so my name is Claire Tomlin, I'm a professor in electrical engineering and computer sciences and I, um, uh, I got my PhD from Berkeley and then I was a professor at Stanford uh, for 10 years before I, <laughs> before I made the right decision to move back and be a professor at Berkeley. Um, and uh, and I am, um, I'm a control theorist, that's my area of research, so I do mathematical modeling of systems, and I work with those mathematical models to design practical manipulation techniques or control schemes to try to make those systems more efficient or better or do some kinds of engineering design on them. So I teach both at the undergraduate and graduate level. Um, we're designing a new freshman series course in circuit signals and systems now, so that's something pretty exciting that we're doing, trying to get mathematical modeling down into the freshman level for our, um, for our EECS undergrads. I teach feedback control at the um, junior, senior level for undergrads. And then I teach a series of graduate level courses, this is the one I'm teaching right now, which are really focused around mathematical modeling and their practical implication for different kinds of systems. And some of those tie into the research that I do. So um, I work in, as I said, mathematical modeling, but I think what's sort of more interesting to talk about are the applications that I work on. So one thing that I've been doing for a long time is working with NASA and the FAA on um, automating some of what air traffic controllers now do manually. 
And here we're designing mathematical models of not only the aircraft, but how aircraft flow, how they interact with each other in an air traffic control system so that things like collision avoidance systems for aircraft can be automated. You can design autopilot functions that will actually detect where the other aircraft are and design safe collision avoidance systems to ease some of the workload from air traffic control. And what's exciting now with this is that there's a whole new, I think, era of air traffic control. All these businesses like Amazon and Google want to fly little UAVs to deliver packages. And, and so now the FAA is asking, how will this impact the air traffic system? So we're in a big new design era where we'd like to design collision avoidance systems, for example, but also make sure that these very different types of aircraft work together in the same system. So we've been working on that for a long time. We've also got a number of projects um, on the Berkeley campus where we're looking at energy efficient systems, energy efficient control systems. So if you don't recognize it, this is a kind of a schematic model of the building that you're in right now, Sutar Jedi Hall. And so this is one of our test beds. We've equipped this building with additional sensors and a whole building information system so we can gather information about the building usage, the temperature control, and the, um, the humidity, all sorts of parameters about the building to be able to implement much more efficient control and then use that, so this is one building on campus, but combine this with all the other buildings on campus and think about how we can take these buildings and basically see them as large scale batteries in the, in, in the power grid. So st you, we can use them to store energy and combine that with other buildings to basically provide frequency regulation. So that's something we're working on right now with our colleagues in energy systems. And then one more project, so we work on a number of projects, but I'm just highlighting three, and this is quite different from the others, but it still has at its core these topics of mathematical modeling and use modeling to understand systems. We're working, and we have been working for a number of years with biologists, and, and so I work with uh, developmental biologists, and this particular project is with cancer biologists. We're um, trying to use mathematical models to help understand um, regulatory networks, protein regulatory networks within cells. And this is, a, this is part of a model of something we're building um, for a, a particularly aggressive type of breast cancer. Um, so it's called HER2 positive breast cancer. It's a particular gene that's overexpressed and it accounts for about 30% of the breast cancers. And um, the issues are that the current drugs that are designed for this type of breast cancer, they only work in about 30% of the cases. So if your patient taking these drugs um, in um, about 70% of the cases, the, the drugs will be ineffective and the cancer will come back. And, and there's not a really good understanding of why. And it's clear that it's something to do with the dynamics of the network. So building a mathematical model in which we can um, probe and simulate in a computer the dynamics of this network will, we hope, ultimately help us understand what's going on in the real system. And here we work very closely with the experimental biologists and we update our models with their experimental data. We suggest new experiments and there's a very tight feedback loop there. So we're using models and mathematics to both um, design control systems, but then also like in a case like that to reverse engineer the systems to help understand how they work. Um, just to this go on to maybe a neat example, this goes to back to something related to um, the first thing I talked about. We, um, we not only do the kind of mathematical modeling and the, um, you know, working things that sort of proving that things will converge and, you know, doing the, the design, but we also do um, implementations on campuses. So we have students who are interested in robotics who'd actually like to try these things out, but it's hard to go and try things out on the air traffic control system. So while we work with NASA and the FAA, we also have um, a robotics lab in which we test some of these algorithms out on, you know, smaller systems. And so we have here, this is an experiment we're running. There's four students. And um, we've got four of our, these are our quad rotors. They're, they're little unmanned aircraft. They're fully autonomous. They're about this big, four rotors for quad rotors. And you can control them very effectively by con doing relative control on the different rotors. So you can you know, manage the, the pitch and roll and get the thing to move around. Quite, they're quite maneuverable. These we built ourselves and we did all the control systems ourselves. 
So what the experiment we're running now is, is an experiment of one of our collision avoidance algorithms. We've got the four students and each has um, a manual control for the aircraft. So for, during most of the experiment, the aircraft are under manual control, like a joystick. But when the aircraft come within a certain distance of each other, so these zones that are computed by our algorithm, just as they come on the boundary of these zones, the control that is guaranteed to keep the aircraft separated will automatically come into effect and basically take over control from the, from the student pilot and guide the aircraft away from each other. So even in this experiment, when we decided that the students were gonna try to get the aircraft to collide with each other, these safe zones, which are basically, you know, they're like sort of repelling the aircraft from each other, will come into effect and safely guide the aircraft back to their, um, you know, something close to their original trajectories. Okay, and then to, to end up, um, we've got a number of projects, both in sort of theory and algorithms, automation and systems biology. And then um, I wanted to just mention some of the work we've been doing in outreach. So Fiona mentioned our inaugural um, Berkeley Girls in Engineering program that we held this summer. And it's, um, uh, as she said, a week-long program. So we did the pilot program this summer where we had two weeks. Um, we invited um, 60 girls um, from local middle schools to the Berkeley campus, and we'd arranged a week full of um, both <coughs> sort of general concepts in um, engineering, including things like presenting your project ideas and um, elevator pitches and organization and poster presentations. But also they had, um, you know, real engineering modules in um, biomechanics and in robotics and in um, computing and, and coding and um, materials and big data. So they, they spent the week going through these series of modules. They went to, we had um, a wonderful afternoon at Pixar where nine of the women engineers at Pixar stood up in front of the girls and they basically showed them what they did and, and you know, broke down some of the movie clips for them. So that they really got to see you know, the picture into what, what engineers do. Um, and then we've been involved in a number of other activities, which I've listed a few of here. Um, but one of the things that we found over the course of doing these outreach programs is that it's important to go back and start at the middle school level. We were doing a lot of work with local high schools, and I think we found that you know it's it's middle school when you really need to sort of get the girls involved and show them that engineering is maybe not what they thought it was. It's got a whole bunch of interesting things and, um, and they should really look into it and sort of start thinking about it at middle school for you know, planning what they're gonna take in high school. Okay, thanks very much. Good morning, so thank you for coming out on this Saturday morning to be with us and um, thank you Claire for paving the way for our conversation. So this is my research group, the Medical Polymer Group, and as Fiona kindly said, I work in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. I also carry an appointment in the Department of Bioengineering and an adjunct position at UCSF in the Department of Orthopedics. You can see here, we're a big advocate of both undergraduate research and also women in the, in the group. And there's a lot of natural selection that just occurs. It's, uh, it's not that I go out and do anything very special as much as we are advocates for teamwork. We do societal work in the sense of what our research focus is in terms of bringing back materials and mechanical challenges back to medical devices, impacting, and what I'll go through is like some examples, how we can improve other people's lives. And that seems to be a draw for women. A lot of the women who join my research group, they come out of my courses, they've had some experience, they get to see some of the case studies that we do, and I think women get drawn into um, making an impact and improving others' lives. And going back to uh, what Fiona shared, is we very much are advocates for teamwork within the research setting of the laboratory. So we're working on engineering challenges in medical devices, but we're often segregating those out into team-based projects. And so everyone feels like they're a part of a bigger whole, but there's a lot of collaboration. There's a lot of, of mentorship that goes on. Students will join our lab anywhere from freshman year to their junior or senior years, but generally we tend to recruit in younger, and they will stay. They will stay for the whole four years. 
Many of them have then gone on to grad school, med school, and a number of them have stayed with us for graduate school as well. So I can't do the work we do without the undergraduate researchers and graduate researchers that we have here at Berkeley. And I think, excuse me, um, as many of my colleagues feel, there is something incredibly special about the undergraduates here at Berkeley. There is a passion and a commitment that you feel in the classroom and it's just a, an incredible opportunity for me as a faculty member to teach, but also to have those same students in our laboratory. Like Claire, I teach at both the undergraduate and graduate level. So at the undergraduate level, I've been involved with our freshman introduction to engineering design. When I was involved in that, we actually took our engineering students and we brought them to the Lawrence Hall of Science. And the task was to teach the engineering design process to K through eight. So we went up to the Lawrence Hall of Science, we re-engineered some of the projects that were up there on the floor and actually tried to teach what it is, what it's like to be an engineer, but try to do that for children, to actually literally would have them step through the path of what it means to be a problem solver, to be a young engineer. I teach a core course in the mechanical engineering curriculum, mechanical behavior of engineering materials, and then I teach a structural aspects of biomaterials, which really is just a fancy way of saying medical device design. And that's a big draw. It's a draw for bioengineers and mechanical engineers. What's interesting for me, I think Fiona shared some of the statistics, a lot of my classes I will see 50% women. And so again, I have the opportunity of then recruiting into the laboratory. But every time I've taught my medical device design course, we're roughly just <coughs> shy of about a 50% population of women. I teach that same course uh, with a graduate version. I'm currently teaching polymer engineering, which is a graduate course. I teach fracture mechanics, mechanics and materials. I've also taught our pedagogy course, such as teaching our grad students how to be better teachers. And I've also taught personal and uh, team leadership. We do a lot of undergraduate research in the lab, and we are big advocates in the lab for doing outreach. We just spent last weekend doing a Young Scholars Program associated with Johns Hopkins, and it brought in about 150 high school students who had some interest, actually middle school and high school students, who had interest in engineering, in particular biomechanics, medical device design. And so our research team are also big advocates for putting the lab out there, inviting the public in, inviting young people in in particular, to try to get them a snapshot of what it means to be a young engineer. So we're big advocates for these outreach activities. We're big advocates for improving the contribution of women in engineering and, of course, having societal impact. And this is a textbook that we recently put out, uh, Medical Device Design. I teach from this textbook. And Ayana is a former PhD student of mine who's now gone out into industry quite successfully. And then we also utilized undergraduates who were in the lab to become our illustrators. So again, they were part of that process of developing that project, that book. The work we do in our lab is biomechanics, but it integrates so much. So we work with orthopedic surgeons. We work, we have a lot of students in our lab who come from either bioengineering, we've got material scientists, we have some that come from molecular and cell biology, and mechanical engineering. So again, that diversity within the framework of our research setting. And part of what we do as the mechanical engineering side is to understand what are the mechanical challenges of our different joints. It's a very different mechanical challenge of our shoulder in terms of rotation, translation, being able to pick something up, versus the hip, versus the knee, and what we need for one particular joint is not what we need for another joint. So trying to understand some of the challenges. So we have a lab that really focuses on some of the key foundation challenges for how do you better understand the, the kinematics, the actual mechanical translation in those joint spaces. And we've built a custom tribo tester from scratch, which can simulate the types of motions we expect to see in hips, knees, or shoulders. And that's been essentially machined and designed grassroots from scratch. We've spent a lot of time in the machine shop, a lot of our mechanical engineering undergrads down in the shop actually designing out constituents. And so it's a nice way to 
bring together mechanical engineering with some of the other engineering demands. We think about designing materials to go in the body, you're competing with cartilage, which is self-lubricating, has a lot of um, engineering properties that we can try to mimic, and yet we're limited by what materials can be used in the body because of biocompatibility. Generally, we like titanium for the stem because we can get good osseointegration. We can get better modulus match to the adjacent bone. We use that same type of material as the counterbearing, and then we'll either use a zirconia or ceramic or a cobalt chrome type alloy as the head. And then counterbearer to that is a polymer. And it's a polymer that's been used since about 1960. We do a lot of work in our lab to understand what we can do to make that material better, what we can do to make that material more wear resistant. So for many years, the polymer debris that got generated in the joint space became the weak link in the system. So that particulate debris then elicits a biological response and we would get loosening of the implant system. So essentially a mechanically induced biological failure. And some of the engineering challenges come about through wear, fatigue, and fracture, which again is a nice boundary between material science and mechanical engineering. So a lot of our work is trying to optimize designs and microstructures to try to tailor out fatigue crack propagation resistance, wear resistance, and oxidation resistance in the body so that we can move the success rates that are currently at 90% or so for hips at the 20-year junction. Can we move them out to 30 years? Can we move them out to 40 years? And that becomes hugely important for society as we get more active, younger patients, as baby boomers hit that time frame for needing total joint reconstruction, it's important to have mechanical integrity that's not just limited at the 18-year mark. So a lot of our work um, focuses on how do we better optimize the designs and the materials utilized to have a huge improvement in societal impact. And I think, as I said at the start of this, that's part of the draw for women. I think there's a big um, recruitment that goes into taking engineering knowledge and giving back to society. So with that, I will close and I will pass it on. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out on this early Saturday morning. So, my name is Lavanya Jawaharlal, and I'm currently a junior studying mechanical engineering with a concentration in engineering leadership. So, that means, yes, I'm still a student, but I think that no matter what age you are, whether you're undergraduate, whether you're a graduate, or you're a faculty member, we should all be working to be reaching out to women, our undergraduate students, and our younger students starting from K through 12. So, I just want to give you a little bit of information about what I've been working on for the past couple of years. I'm also a current ASUC senator, and what that essentially means is I'm part of the student government on campus. And the reason I joined that was to truly just make a bigger impact and do as much as I can to outreach to our students on campus as well as off campus. I hear a lot of talk about the female to male ratio, especially when it comes to engineering. And I grew up in Southern California. I live in a city near Pomona. And so if you are from the area, you'll know that Pomona, as well as the surrounding cities, are a little bit different in terms of income, in terms of, the de in terms of the demographics. And so something that I always think about is, yes, we should be considering the female to male ratio in the STEM fields. But what about the intersectionality of the students on this campus, as well as the students applying to STEM fields in high school? This data was pulled from CalAnswers. So these are the statistics of our census from the 2014 spring in the last uh, column over there. And right over here, this kind of has our ethnic breakdown within the College of Engineering. So I've highlighted the female and the male ratios. I know it might be a little bit difficult to read, but for example, we have 175 Chinese females in the College of Engineering right now, or in 2014 of spring, but there are 645 men. Going down the list, what I want to bring your attention to is the API community, which is the Asian Pacific Islander community. And if you go across, 
we have one female in the entire College of Engineering that, represent, that represents or identifies with the API community. I want to bring those numbers to your attention because we need to be constantly aware of the students that are within our campus, that are representing the different communities and the backgrounds that they have and the experiences that they've gone through. So this kind of ties into my next slide. My sister and I co-founded STEM Center USA. So STEM standing for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And the reason we did that was a little bit of why I, what I explained right before is there is a large disproportionality of students on this campus, of students across this world. And what we feel is we're very passionate about kids. I love educating. I love young kids, working with them, seeing them smile, whether you're teaching them how to read, count, whatever it is. And so what I want to do is take my love for education as well as my passion for mechanical engineering. I was fortunate enough when I was younger, my parents always gave me like little Legos to play with. They helped me build robots starting from a young age. And that's what got me interested in mechanical engineering. But the important thing is that not everyone gets that opportunity. Not everyone has parents that come from a STEM background. Not everyone has access to robotics kits that they can just purchase for two or three hundred dollars that are really expensive. Kids want it for their Christmas present. And then after they use it for a couple times, they just put it to the side. So what we do is STEM Center has a student outreach program. We work with the public schools and the private schools in the Southern California region, working with teachers to bring in robotics into their classrooms. We want to do it in a hands-on learning way. And we always hear these words. You go into classes and you hear the theory. But how are you able to take the theory and apply it to the real world? How do you connect those two dots? And that's what we're trying to help students to do. So in early age, we've had our Ms. Professor Pruitt, Professor Tomlin, are doing girls in engineering programs. They're working to bring in undergraduates and graduate <coughs> students to conduct research, which I, think, which I think is amazing and it's fantastic. But I also think we should be looking at an even younger age. I started working, at, working with high school students when I was tutoring students about robotics, about math and physics classes. But what I realized is when Women are already in high school, they already know that maybe they don't like math, maybe they don't like science, or they already know I'm not gonna become an engineer, that's too hard or that's too nerdy. So we went to middle school and we started working with the middle school students. And what we found was that once a middle school student had a bad pre-algebra teacher, then they were too scared of algebra and then they were too scared to ever even go into calculus. So that pretty much shut down their path to any STEM field. And so we started looking at the elementary school students and what we found is young kids are like sponges. They just absorb everything, and they are excited to learn. They don't care what other people think. If you call them the nerd, they think that's awesome, because it is. Um, and, <laughs> and it doesn't matter whether you're a girl. It doesn't matter whether you're a boy. It doesn't matter whether you are from a black community or a Hispanic community. It doesn't matter what your income is because when kids are younger, they're willing to learn everything and anything. So we started working with kids K through 12. And I pretty much just put three of our younger kids that have been with us, I'll get out of the way, sorry, um, that have been with us for about a year and a half to two years now. So that means Vayu over here started when he was three and a half years old with us. So he started just basic building blocks. And what we do at our center is we use a variety of different robotics platforms. We don't just use Lego. We go out and see what are all the types of robotics platforms available for students. And we create a continuous program. I like to compare it to soccer practice or basketball practice. We send our kids out to go to all these practices. We want them learning to use their feet and doing hands-on or hand and foot eye coordination. So we're sending our kids to soccer practice twice a week. So why aren't we having our kids practice their creativity, their imagination, and their hands-on learning by doing robotics? And so we have our kids come in once a week every Saturday or once a week every Wednesday after school to work with us for about an hour to two hours depending on their ages. And doing that continuous curriculum, it allows, say, Vayu, who's three and a half, or Franny, who was four, who started with us, it allows them to build motor skills, doing basic blocks, and it also allows them to move forward until in a year they're able to start coding with Scratch. Or they're able to build different things, using Legos, using Fisher Technic, using all sorts of platforms that are able to get them excited about STEM fields. 
it's not that every student has to become an engineer, but it's about like, giving access to students to have the opportunity to learn how cool it is and what STEM fields really are. So to wrap up, some of the main projects I've been working on are these two right over here. So I put them kind of top and bottom, I guess, because one is for our younger kids and one is for our middle school and older kids. The technical alphabet. A stands for apple, B stands for ball, C stands for cat, D stands for dog. We all hear that, we all learn it. I'm sure a lot of the parents taught our kids or taught their kids or the students sitting out there how to read like that. But why doesn't A stand for axle also? What about B is for beam, C is for caliper? So we created the technical alphabet to again, get kids excited about learning early. I mean, how cool would it be if all the young kids, three and four years old are running around, they're going, C is for caliper, and they can tell you what does that mean to measure something. <coughs> and then going down here, this, was the, this is the PyBot. This was a Kickstarter campaign we launched. About, back in March, we were able to raise $113,000 on Kickstarter, and we were able to ship our, our PyBot to over 65 countries um, in the world. <laughs> And so using the PyBot, this is meant for middle school students and above. And the great thing about it is that it's an affordable robot kit. Since we are based in Pomona, we are very aware of the income that the families have that in the surrounding area. They are low income families. And sometimes you can't afford to buy a three or $400 Arduino kit. <coughs> so we created an Arduino compatible robot that costs $75. And students are able to work on this hands on. They get to build their own gearbox. They get to program in a very fun and interactive way. So this program was actually just adopted by Cal Poly Pomona for the Intro to Engineering class. So we're very excited about that. We're also working with several other universities in the country to adopt that into their Intro to Engineering programs as well. Um, the last picture is kind of like, what are my next steps? How are we trying to make a bigger impact for women in engineering, for the different communities that can possibly go into the STEM field? And so I had the opportunity to talk about kind of my passion with Vice President Biden and Dr. Biden at their house this past June. And so my sister and I were able to discuss what are the problems right now? Um, if you go onto a college campus, what are the differences in the gender gap? What are the differences in the intersectionality? So that's kind of where we are now. They were very supportive of it. And hopefully just going forward, we're able to continue our work. Thank you. I'm inviting all of my colleagues up onto the um, stage. Where we've got some chairs. Um, oh, and we have Society of Women Engineers, I think, who are going to be helping move chairs. And um, we don't have that much time left. So um, I'm going to invite, um, give all of you the opportunity to ask some questions from um, our fantastic speakers who are clearly very, very passionate about what they're doing. Um, if you have a question, um, please raise your hand, and I see lots of questions being raised, uh, lots of hands being raised, and um, Dawn will bring a microphone. So um, we'll, we'll start up there, and then we've got a couple down here. Maybe you covered this in your intro, but I'm curious about a couple of things. One is, what is the percentage, if you're able to share, of uh, women faculty in engineering? And the second question is, uh, besides getting kids and um, kids getting interested um, in engineering, are there programs that you have at Berkeley that try to educate the wider population, the next generation of leaders, um, about having more women in engineering? Uh, so, so let me answer, um, uh, start, start that answer. Um, the, the College of Engineering, our faculty is now about 10% women. Um, this is a far cry from when I first arrived here in 1983, um, and you can all do the math, it's been a while. <laughs> um, and um, I was the third female faculty member um, in the college. So um, it, was a, it was a milestone when we got to the point that all of the women couldn't have lunch together 
around a very small table in the women's faculty <laughs> club. So, so now um, we actually have so, ma so many that I don't even, um, n I can't even sort of list off everybody. Um, in terms of outreach, um, we have an awful lot of um, activities going on. Um, many of these are coordinated by our student groups, our um, students at both the graduate and particularly at the undergraduate level, um, have truly embraced the college's mission, which is educating leaders, creating knowledge and serving society. And um, they're very, very passionate about um, outreach, particularly to um, schools in underserved neighborhoods, and there are plenty of those very close to the Berkeley campus. And we work with our student societies and provide them with financial support. Um, and they are unbelievable ambassadors. Uh, you know, you all sensed uh, Lavania's enthusiasm. So sending students like herself out to um, schools is an incredible thing to do. So I, I was happy not just for getting <coughs> uh, young girls interested, but on campus having even the male population be aware that we need to have this more, because these, these gentlemen are going to be leaders for the next generation, and our best programs to reach out to them well, the Society of Women Engineers has quite a few male members, um, so it's, it's, it's a non-discriminatory organization as long as you support women in engineering. <laughs> you, you belong there. But the, the, there was a point in my career, it was probably about 15 years ago, that I saw as a turning point um, in terms of how our male students perceive our female students. When I started my career, when I would establish team, um, you know, projects and things, I had to kind of watch out to um, make sure that, um, you know, the women weren't left out or anything else. And many years ago, I actually saw our male students gravitating towards women whenever there were team projects because um, they recognized the fact that um, their female students were really good at organizing them and doing things. And I reached the point, and I'm sure my colleagues have had similar experiences, where you have to um, actually kind of keep a special eye on the all-male teams. Um. Well, um, I, th I think, though, the problem still persists. Um, we have, uh, in our undergraduate CS courses, we have some problems now in that there are huge enrollments in computer science right now. And in a lot of the um, group projects, it's the partner projects that are a problem that, uh, you know, that the women students complain that they're not given equal footing when it comes to, so there's still issues. But there is something, you know, there's some, immediately when you asked your question, I thought about our, our current search process. We're, we're um, uh, you know, every year we search for new faculty, um, new people to come in. And as p I'm chairing it this year for EECS, and part of it is, there's a um, very substantial training process as part of the search committee to look at the statistics and to ask, you know, what are, you know, what would we like to do? How are we going to recruit more women and minorities? And sort of, you know, the discussions about the kinds of ways that we can, in the interview process, how we do the recruitment, how we get that, um, you know, it's a pipeline issue, but when we get women coming in, for example, how the kinds of things we, we can do to make it more positive for them. Yeah, following on uh, Professor Tomlin's comment, I think when you first write the job description, that's your first opportunity. Like if you write it in the very broadest way, you have a much clearer sweep of, sus of what your technical um, pool will look like. And I think sometimes, at least in mechanical engineering, we've written the scope too narrowly and we've excluded <coughs> who might have been an excellent match who then see the wording and think that they're not the appropriate match. So putting an, an immense amount of effort into reaching out at that process, <coughs> I, I think trying to grow the female faculty population is important because it helps, I think, in growing the undergraduate and graduate female populations. And I think as we heard, er, I, the pipeline starts very, very young. And I think <coughs> part of that pipeline issue is also, and you probably have experienced this, is 
when young boys see young girls engineering things, it starts to break down the gender barrier at a very early age. I know my daughter's, she's just in kindergarten now, and she's been to Camp Galileo twice, and she's very much into the engineering design <laughs> process, and she's all about innovation and learning and, and understanding that engineering is problem solving, and I think you, you've echoed that in your work. I absolutely think that our campus is very supportive of the outreach groups on you know, like on our campus. So we have Society of Women Engineers, we have WonderWorks, we have Pioneers in Engineering, and these are groups that are outwardly working to work on campus as well as off campus with both females and males. And so they are working to help create that next generation of STEM leaders. Okay, um, there's a couple of questions down here. Yeah. Uh, Thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. Um, I, I wanted to announce that we have a Kickstarter, Notable Women in Computing. Uh, it's the first and only time anybody's ever done this. We've put together 54 Notable Women in Computing, including two Berkeley uh, professors. Um, and we're selling it on Kickstarter. We sold out at the Hopper Conference this week. In fact, I don't have any cards to show you because all of my cards were sold. Uh, but if you want to go to the Kickstarter and look up Notable Women in Computing, we're taking orders for teachers, we're taking orders for universities, we're taking orders for individuals, and if you want to establish role models like the amazing people here uh, and hand them out to kids like the ones running around here, um, please buy a deck. We're not going to place any more orders. This is a one-time opportunity. So, so maybe you could stand at the exit yeah. at the end of the session and provide information. Thank you. Uh, oh, actually, there's, there's one over here, so, yes. Uh, just a quick question. Um, for many of the engineering pursuits, you've got parallel pursuits um, in uh, bio sci, uh, chemistry, math. Um, how, uh, what, what is the, the women's participation in those other kind of parallel STEM pursuits versus engineering, and is engineering um, holding its own, so to speak? Clay, you, you obviously work um, extensively across campus, and Lisa. <laughs> well, my, uh, I actually don't have the exact numbers, but it's clear that there are um, a lot more women. So I, I go to s some systems biology conferences, and I work with biologists. There's a lot more women in biology, um, and, uh, you know, at these... It's interesting because I'm used to going to engineering conferences where I'm only like the only woman in the bathroom in the hotel, and that when you go to biology conferences, that's not the case. Um, but no, you can. So, but I think um, it, it's interesting when you look at the interface because um, you know that I think s some of these, as, as Lisa was saying, when you uh, when you look at some of these problems in biology and engineering together, there's often the societal impact, and there is a draw for women to um, work on problems that are gonna make an impact or have a clear directional impact to society. So I see not only more women in those parallel areas, but more women in the, inter in, in the engineering discipline that's addressing those problems. In mechanical engineering, just as a follow-up to, to Clara's comment, if you look at the women that are in the graduate program and where they land research-wise, they do tend to be drawn towards societal impact so green manufacturing, uh, engineering design, biomechanics. So we, we may only have 20% women, but they're not spread across all the disciplines of mechanical engineering. There may, in fact, only be four primary areas, and they generally are driven by societal impact. So going back to some of these other issues, we have to really rethink when we're looking at job search and recruiting out and drawing in more women, is just recognizing that. And uh, I think it's a very <coughs> astute point you have. And just, uh, just adding on to that, I think one of the challenges that I see as ongoing is that, um, you know, sort of going through the K through 12 system, um, girls are indeed drawn to making a societal impact. And I think a key to increasing the participation of women in engineering is better communicating the fact that the entire spectrum of engineering activities have a profound societal impact. Mm -hmm. There are some where the connection is very obvious and we aren't doing such a great job in communicating the societal impact of some of our other areas. Um, I think we've got time for one more question um, here. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I was drawn by the fact that you're looking at these drones and the, the <coughs> patterns and so forth. Uh, we can't land airplanes at some airports like San Francisco. I was wondering if you're doing anything in that regard, if you're static or like aircraft carriers or anything. And the traffic, I looked at the <coughs> lights in the sky at night. Uh, if you go to images, Google images and look, it is one bright planet full of planes and so forth. So uh, I find it interesting uh, that there's much more to just the collision. There's all the other aspects too. Yeah, I, I mean, we've worked on a number of problems and there's, as you mentioned San Francisco, the runways are too close together to land aircraft in parallel on foggy days. So they, um, they actually have to sequence them and that reduces the landing capacity by half. So you could use technology like this to actually you know, take over the landing from the pilots on foggy days, which is like most of the summer in San Francisco. So, <laughs> so, so you know, there, there was a, a, several years ago, there was a campaign to, um, uh, to try to increase the runway spacing in San Francisco, which would fill in part of the bay. And uh, there was a lot of environmental impact and eventually it went down. But around that time, they started looking into these automated technologies for doing that. So yes, there's a whole bunch of other problems other than collision avoidance that can be impacted um, by technology like this. Um, well, with that, uh, I, oh, one, one, <laughs> last, one last question. This really is the last question. <laughs> I saw on your listing there is automation, there's a robotic. Is the robot, robotic is a part of the project or is a part of the major in the, in the, in the department? Uh, okay, so we, I mean, it's part of the research project. Could you, could you repeat the question? Uh, yeah, the, the question was uh, um, automation and robotics. When we list that, is it, is it a major um, in engineering or in ECS, or is it part of the research program? And the answer is both. We have a, um, we have a, 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 no, a, fairly, a fairly large research program in robotics, but we also have a major called CRR, <coughs> Control Intelligent Systems in Robotics. And so we have a number of courses in robotics. Um, we have, um, we're, we've got, uh, you know, upper level undergraduate courses, graduate courses. We've been talking about introduction courses and, and that's something that I think Lavanya would have a lot to say with. Uh, yeah, yes, know. maybe you could talk about um, robotics from a mechanical engineering perspective. Um, well, I do know that the mechanical engineering electives do allow you to take yep. um, different courses in different areas. So one of them being robotics. I haven't taken it yet, though. <laughs> um, I don't think I have the prereqs quite yet for it. I think you have the prereqs. <laughs> I'm, I'm only a junior. I still have a year and a half to go. <laughs> okay, yeah, you come here for advising. Um, you know, we also have mechanical engineering faculty who are very um, deeply engaged in making enormous contributions. So um, robotics is, is highly interdisciplinary, as, as of course are so many engineering fields these days. Um, and one of our challenges in advising um, our undergraduates is getting them to see that societal problems are interdisciplinary and choosing one form of set of tools to become expert in over another doesn't lock you into working on one particular type of problem. Um, you know, so most people wouldn't think that somebody with Claire's background would be able to make seminal contributions to breast cancer. Um, just to give an example of how engineers can truly make an impact, um, you know, across the entire field. Okay, um, with that, I do think that we should close this session, um, but I think maybe our speakers can hang around a bit outside if there are any individual questions. But let me take this opportunity to ask you to thank our panelists one more time. <laughs>